Okay, take a look at these two clips. Who's going faster? Well, of course, it's the one on the right, right? Well, not exactly. They're actually going the same speed. It's funny though, you'd swear that the one on the right just feels faster. And well, who can blame you? Game developers constantly add virtual trickery to make their games feel faster than they actually are. This isn't a bad thing, and it's actually there to make you, the player, feel good. So, how do they do it? How do video games trick us into feeling speed? Well, by the end of this video, you'll be able to spot lots of different tricks game developers use. So much that you'll even be able to notice everything about this mystery game I'm saving for last. Ooh, mysterious. Better stick out to the end, huh? I'm willing to bet everybody here has played Minecraft before. How do I know? Don't ask. So odds are most of you have already manipulated our first setting on the list, the field of view, or FOV for short. As the name suggests, this setting manipulates the virtual camera to control how much of the game you see at a given moment. It's really common to see FPS players turn up their FOV as it allows them to see more of a room. And this is great! You get a heightened sense of awareness that allows you to possibly spot more enemy players in your peripheral vision. Well that's nice, but what does this have to do with speed? Or Minecraft for that matter? Well, since we have more to see, it feels as if more of the world is rushing towards us. Even just walking around after changing it feels way faster, even though the speed Steve walks at is the same. As you press the run key, the field of view does expand slightly more. Again, to build off of the illusion that you broke off into a sprint. So maybe a potion of swiftness might not be as fast as you think it is. But the FOB being cranked up definitely sells the immersion, doesn't it? This goes both ways. Crank the FOB down, and it feels as if you're looking at the world through binoculars. Walking becomes sluggish and even borderline disorienting at times. This is why cinematic games and documentaries use a lower FOV. It flattens the scene and gives it more intention, whereas high FOV is more chaotic. So just cranking your FOV up to 11 won't make everything better. First off, objects in front of you are gonna start to look smaller. Things such as enemies or details shrink down to accommodate for all the extra room, so it can actually be redundant to crank the FOV all the way up if you won't be able to appreciate anything. You also get distortion, which is good to sell the effect, but not all developers want it to happen. And higher FOVs also mean that you're rendering more of the game world at a given time, which can reduce performance. But enough camera magic, let's see what they do to the actual characters. The way a character moves and reacts shapes how we perceive them. It's not just about nice effects, it's about presence. Feeling the weight behind characters is just as important for the players to feel. Even if they're not going as fast as others, it can make them feel real and part of a living world. Mirror's Edge Catalyst is a game I could ramble on and on about, so make sure to subscribe if you want to stay tuned for that video. At its core, it's a game all about momentum and maintaining it. The developer's job was to sell you faith as a real parkour master, sprinting through the rooftops of a corporate dystopian city. So, did they really nail down on the feel? Let's talk player models. If we take a look at her standard running animation, you'll notice that her hands are slightly shown at the bottom of the frame. And it's this one tiny detail that really helps cement the weight of her character and her speed building up. Other speed games can forfeit doing this, opting to have the first player view free of limbs. But without them, you lose press. These subtle gestures give your brain a sense of physicality. You feel her accelerating and pushing through the environment. And we can start to see more of her model as she uses more advanced moves like slides, rolls, and vaults. Take the roll as an example. Observe how, as she heads to the ground, Faith coils herself into a ball. She then plants her hand in the ground to support herself as she's about to begin rolling. Then, as the sky comes to view, she extends one of her legs to make a smooth transition back upright. Seriously, the way they designed the body and especially the foot to guide your view helps with the flow and realism of the movement. Conversely, if you're rolling backwards, Faith will use her arms to push herself up at the end. So if you notice, every movement has a natural coiling and decompressing, following naturalistic laws of conservation. I don't know what any of that means, but it makes me sound smart, so I'll keep it in. They could have easily done without the player model, but it would have resulted in a drastically different game feel. Less grounded and interesting, in my opinion. And while not speed related, her first person takedowns have a good weight to them. Mmm, yeah, she can take me down any day. Like Ebe -beb. Wait, scratch that. Some of these attacks use the momentum you've gained to deal massive damage, and they have some pretty nice looking animations as well. Especially with those kicks. You see more of her model at play here, guiding your view into. Okay, before we head into the sound department, let's tackle one more topic. 
Ah, particles. The breadcrumbs of motion. You know, I feel bad for these guys. They're almost never talked about, but these guys can carry their own weight. So even though this section is short, it's still pretty important to mention. In haste, your character creates a small trail of dirt whenever she's running around. That's a classic environmental particle. It's the typical dust telling your brain, hey, I'm moving fast. Dive down like a kamikaze and that character will start to have her own air bubble-like thing enveloping her. Then there's others that live more in the camera than on the game world, such as your typical anime wind streaks. They're used everywhere and people just kind of tune them out by now, as they're commonly expected when expressing speed, whether mild or intense. Anyways, one more section to go, then it's the mystery game. I wonder what that could be. So you know how a car as a car go- Okay, that. Yeah, that. That's the Doppler effect. It's just a fancy way of saying that as a source of sound comes towards you, its perceived pitch is higher. But when it heads away from you, the pitch is lowered. Note that this only works when the observer is not in the object of motion. That's why you don't hear the Doppler effect when you're driving around. A sonic boom is actually just that, too many sound waves getting mushed together so close that they come out as a single enormous shock. Let's take Battlefield 1 for instance. Yeah, yeah, I know I can't stop glazing the game, but this is a good example, as the game is not trying to sell you your own character speed, but rather that of objects around you. Wait, that's what the Doppler effect does. <laughs> the clearest example are plane flybys. Whenever an aircraft passes overhead, you hear the engine pitch shifting. That's pretty neat. You also hear projectiles zoom past you, from slow mortar strikes striking around you to bullets whizzing by. In every case, Doppler pops in and shifts the pitch as soon as they approach, leave, or collide with an object nearby, telling you both how fast they're moving and how dangerous they are. This is pretty good auditory information to give the player, especially cause, you know, play this game without a HUD and seriously, the danger feels real. So far I've shown the elements independently from each other, so let's now take a look at that game I was telling you. Let's take it as a case study to see how all the effects are applied. So without further ado, the next game is... <laughs> you thought you could get away from me, didn't you? It's only natural to cap the video off with the symbol of speed in gaming. Wait, did I make this video just to show this game off? Maybe, but you're here so we're doing it anyways. Let's go layer by layer and see how the game fares in the tricks we've established. So as Sonic starts to break off into a run, the camera slowly pans closer and lower to him. This not only sells you the initial acceleration, but it lets you see more of what's coming ahead. Sonic's position in relation to the camera is constantly being changed, and it will vary a lot depending on what the developers want us to look out for. If we want speed, Sonic is gonna hang back, but if we need to pay attention, like in turns, or if it just wants to show off some good scenery, the camera will guide us. It feels like a drone trying to keep up with the guy. <laughs> Poor pilot. Okay, so then you press the boost button and- OH MY GOD! Right off the bat, a sonic boom ripples throughout the screen as soon as you press it. It's a neat little trick to make the transition seem seamless, and it helps to separate when you're going from a normal run to the boost mode. This visual cue also hides the slight FOV increase. It's kind of like how we mentioned that Minecraft handles the FOV when sprinting. Just a small boost to improve that sensation. Basic stuff, people. Come on. And if you're looking anywhere but at the center of the screen, which you should be, you're playing a game, goddammit, you'll notice that the motion blur is cranked up to a million. Seriously, pause at any given moment and you'll see various smears and streaks all over the screen, especially near the edges. Sonic's shoes also get a little bit of that blur, making his run resemble the crazy aids he did back in the Genesis era. This blur also eliminates distractions and keeps you looking ahead. It guides your eyes into what comes next. Things like obstacles to look out for or hey, you tripped, didn't you? Ugh, what did I tell you? The version I'm playing, which is a wonderful recompiled version for the PC, link in the description, has the option to turn off motion blur. But I'd say it's a sin, as you seriously will not get the same experience with this setting off. It's night and day. Throughout the boost, Sonic is enveloped in a blue field of pure speed. And whenever this fellow commits property damage, the game's gonna show you with some impact particles. And while the Marsa animators created absolute cinema with the pixel level cinematic in the very beginning, does this feeling of speed translate into the actual game model? Well yeah, Sonic has to be the biggest indicator of speed, as that's kind of his whole thing, with his arms hanging behind him and his quills flared back. Even without some of the other effects, he would still look fast. 
put it together and you can see why this game is a master of raw. Oh wait, I forgot about the Doppler effect. Um, where is it? No, no. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but I swear I couldn't really hear an instance of it in the audio. But what a lot of Sonic games do is pretty neat nonetheless. Listen how the music changes before and after you boost. Notice that? It gets tinier and it loses most of its body. It probably employed a low pass filter and other effects to make the focus on that rush of going fast. It's a brilliant example of how audio can be used to communicate a feeling. By stripping away the richness of the music, the game's basically telling you that you've entered the flow state. True velocity and wind filling your ears. Well, I'd say this game fared out pretty well. Yep, that's the only thing the game has. Nothing else. Truly a masterclass. So yeah, that's the magic of speeding games. Developers bend every trick they can so when you pick up the controller, you don't just see the rush. You feel it. Phew! Well, that was a doozy. Anyways, you know the drill. Comment your thoughts below, like, subscribe. Oh, and before I forget, I started a Patreon if you feel like ever leaving a tip. With just a small contribution, you can get access to updates on my videos and all the other stuff I set up after I finish the script.